so there we go. Uh, Moths in winter. Um, and it is a part of a series of also wildlife talks that are on, um, you know, from now. Uh, there's quite a, quite a few of them, I think. Um, so there's a wee slide at the end. So I'll tell you a, a bit about them. Um, so there we go. Yeah, I did it all already, I guess. But yeah, around about 30 minutes, hopefully. Uh, it'll either be too short or it'll be too long. Um, you know, I'll just see what happens. But yeah, the time for uh 30 minutes of question and answering is pretty long actually that sounds like a real grilling to be honest uh but anyway uh, it's been recorded and I, i've I, I mentioned that before you know, use the chat facility so anyway moths in northern ireland um and just just as a, a very 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 brief uh you know background uh, nearly 1200 species and a lot of people aren't aware of that um it's one of the most diverse and largest groups of species that we have um you know, only things like the beetles and flies kind of compare, unless you're talking about things like bacteria, because they'll always win in terms of the number of species, because they increase hourly. Uh, but 1,200 species, 700 of them are micromoths, 475 are uh, macromoths. I mean, it's just a, it's just shy of uh, 1,200 species. About actually, it's about 12, 1,189, something like that. So. You know, there's a sort of a momentous occasion. There's going to be a big party whenever Northern Ireland gets to 1,200 species. It'll just be me in, at the party, like, because uh, everybody else will be thinking that's a strange thing to do. But half a million records in the Northern Ireland database. Um, so that's the contribution that moth recorders, uh, people go out and record moths, but also just members of the public. Everybody who puts in a moth record, if you like, has a, not a say, but, you know, they're, they're, they're a, a, if you like, a stakeholder in that because it's, you know, half a million records is... Phenomenal. Um, it's one of the largest, if not the largest databases uh, that's held by, uh, you know, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and it's all down to people. If people didn't submit the records, there would be no records there. So it's a sort of, I like to think of it as a very, very large group effort uh, and, and, and a milestone, really. Um, and yeah, the vast majority of these species, it's spring, summer and autumn. You know, I mean, it goes without saying, it's, it's like butterflies, you know, butterflies are moths. Um, but, you know, most it's all about heat, heat and light. So by and large, that's what insects like, invertebrates like, it's like most creatures like. Uh, but so most of them, most of them actually die off um, during the, as adults anyway, before the winter comes. And quite a few fly in uh, autumn, but some of them, you can only see them in winter. <coughs> so you've got the different, I just put this slide in just to show the different life stages of moth. So, it's, there's the four stages of you know a moth, an egg, and a caterpillar, the pupa, you know, and its chrysalis, uh, and yeah, the adult moth. Um, now the thing about moths, some of them, yeah, some of them die off, but some of them, how, how do they survive? Well, they have to survive the winter somehow, you know. So some of them actually overwinter as eggs, you know. So they're laid on the bits of bark or leaves or you know places where the birds can't find them essentially and other predators. Um, and then they'll come out in the spring, some over winter as a caterpillar, uh, some as a pupae in the ground, uh, and some over winter as adults. Some of them fly all winter, but some of them kind of they hibernate, um, uh, which is a bit confusing actually these days for the moths in terms of climate change. Because, you know, before our seasons were sort of not, not necessarily fixed. I mean, they were a little bit malleable, but now things are a wee bit skew with to say the least. So you know, uh, all it takes is a series of uh, warm days in early spring, you know, when it should be cold or maybe we don't get so many frosts and that that puts things out of kilter a bit. So, you know, beforehand, I would have expected, you know, 20 years ago, things were not necessarily rigid, but if somebody had said, I've seen, seen such and such a moth in, uh, you know, February, I would have said, oh, you're that's a bit crazy. But now there are confirmed records of moths turning up you know, at all times of the year, uh, and that's not a good thing. Uh, so there's one of the moths that you might see. Uh, it's a common moth, it's a thing called angle shades. Uh, called angle shades because it's a spectacular moth, um, really nice. And in the photos, never really do it justice, but they've got this lovely, when they're fresh, this lovely pinkish flush through them, um, and lots of you know, sort of dark olive greens and things like that. But also, it's called angle shades because the wings are creased. So when you turn the moth around and look at it, you can see the wings are actually look like they're folded. Um, so it, it just doesn't look right, you know. Um, 
but a really, really nice moth. And it's, it's this is one of the species that will come to your window. That's why I've included it. Now, it can be seen in any month of the year, but mostly it's seen round. They come as resident moths, but also a, a lot of them in round the end of summer, say, and yeah, well into the autumn, numbers are bolstered by immigrants. So uh, coming from continental Europe or even just coming from Great Britain. Uh, so we got our numbers, uh, you see this peak in numbers in uh, late summer and autumn, but they can't be seen at any time of year. Uh, and I say, it's one of those ones that, you know, you would see maybe coming, you know, you would see it in your, on your porch or on a windowsill or something like that in the morning. So, or on a wall is another good place to look for moths. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a common moth because, uh, you know, if you look at the food plants there, nettle, bramble, dock, oak, birch, that's quite a broad range and, and several different species in between that it's not limited to that. So, but it also overwinters as a caterpillar. So there's the caterpillars. Um, and yeah, but it's caterpillars are difficult. I'm, I'm going to put my hands up. They are, yeah, they're almost like a different doctrine in themselves. It's almost, almost knowing the adult moths is a different ball game to knowing the caterpillars and then the eggs and the pupa is a, a different thing altogether. Like you, know, um, but um, there's the caterpillars and you can see those caterpillars. It's essentially they come out in one long generation, so you can see the adults and you can see the caterpillars at any time of year. But the reason I include it is because it's one of those species that, you know, it's one of the few species that you would encounter uh, during the winter. Uh, there's another one. I'm kind of rewinding the clock here. Um, so, you know, obviously I'm not just talking about the moths that you'd see in January, but I'm focusing on the moths at this time of year. But, you know, winter does start obviously a bit earlier uh, than January or December. So there's a moth that um, the satellite, it's named the satellite because when you look at the photograph, uh, the large white circle has two little satellite dots, uh, hence the name. Um, one of the more inventive names for a moth. In fact, you know, to me, it actually, you know, if it wasn't named the, the satellite and it didn't have those markings, it would be, well, I hate to say a boring thing, but, uh, you know, certainly that name gives it sort of an almost you know, mythical properties, you know, the satellite. And it is one of those moths when it appears at the moth trap, you know, you, you do like seeing it. Um, and it comes to light and sugar. So it's, an, it's essentially it's an autumn moth. And what happens is it comes out, you know, around September, October, uh, peaks around that time. And by November, the numbers tail off. Uh, but it's not that the moths are dying off. It's that those moths are hibernating or going into a state of torpor. It's not necessarily the same as a, a mammalian hibernation. Um, so really you start seeing them, in, you know, and again, you go out with your garden and with a torch, you know, and, and say in the autumn and look around things like, you know, blackberries and ivy, you know, when the ivy's in full blossom, uh, it, it's such an important nectar source and lots of insects use it. So it's the sort of thing that you can go out and have a look in your garden and you'll see, uh, you know, uh, the satellite moth. Um, and again, it's another one. A lot of these moths are strongly attracted to light. So that's why, you know, particularly if you live in the country and, you know, your, your kitchen light in the evening might be the only light around for, you know, some distance, um, you, you will probably attract moths. Um, and I mentioned the caterpillars are omnivorous. Uh, they, they eat a wide range of uh, deciduous plants and uh, quite an awful lot of the, the moths that fly during the wintertime, the moths that I'm going to cover in this talk, they do feed on, you know, a broad range of deciduous trees. Um, and yeah, that's probably something that is advantageous, you know, uh, rather than restricting yourself to a single food plant. But the caterpillars of the satellite moth, you know, they might be eating hawthorn and birches and willows and things like that. But when they get to a certain stage, they change. Uh, and if they get the opportunity, they'll eat the caterpillars of other species. Uh, just to me, there's something, something like out of a, a horror movie that you know a caterpillar eating another caterpillar you're not meant to do that you're meant to be eating a leaf but no going around and eating other caterpillars uh there's other uh, caterpillars some species that uh they'll they're uh cannibalistic so it's it's a it's a rat race you know it's whichever you know whichever caterpillar gets uh, the biggest first will eat eat all its uh, brothers and sisters and if you're a if you're a caterpillar you likely is you have an awful lot of brothers and sisters to eat um, there's the satellite comes in two color forms, not a great photograph, but it either comes with uh, the, the, the white uh, mark uh, with the two satellites uh, or in an orange form. 
Uh, and sometimes it can be a bit obscure and you can't see it, but uh, by and large, um, you know, that's that's what, you, you know, it's a satellite, it's a great moth. Uh, still staying in the, the last year, if you like, or if, it depends what way you look at it. I mean, it's, uh, it's either the year, the months gone past or the months to come, but you have this group called the November moths. Um, they are a bit of a pain. There's four different photographs. Um, they could be four different species of moths there, or it could be one species. You can't tell them by external characteristics. The only way to tell them is through uh, killing them in dissection or by uh, looking at the genitals of the males, which you don't have to. But then if you have a, if you get a female, um, yeah, you can't, you can't do them that way. So part of the way that you can separate them well number one small autumnal moth um is extremely rare in northern ireland um there's only a couple of sites for it uh and the other ones you could maybe do uh, well maybe you could do small autumnal moth on timing because it'll be one of the first autumnal moths to come or november moths to come out but then that might work up to a point until climate change starts getting in the way and if you look at the timings of those other moths you know autumnal moth comes out from october to november pale November, September to November. Um, what, in terms of the phenology, you know, when the emergence uh, time of these things, um, climate change could start to mess with that a bit. And, you know, rather than pale November moth coming out in late September, it might come out in early September, then there's an overlap with the other species. So uh, the easiest way to get around this, and it is, it's a total nightmare really, um, because you know it's part of the human condition. You want to be able to identify and know what it is that's in front of you, but unfortunately, sometimes you just have to bite the bullet, and that's why it becomes November moth aggregate. So we just lump them all together, and that makes life easier. And to be honest, for once, I'm a, I'm an advocate of that. Usually, I like to know what the species are, but when it comes to things like November moths, I just call them November moths. Uh, there's December moth. Uh, which is, I've said there is strangely named because it flies from October to January. Although arguably you could say that maybe some of the peak numbers are in December. Uh, brilliant moth, um, they can turn up and uh, you can see them sort of parks and gardens and uh, woodland, things like that, but um, not so often seen outside of a moth trap, but I do get records of people who see them, you know, around their house and things like that. And that's an example of a moth that uh, overwinters as an egg. So, you know, the adult, uh, I've recorded this moth in moth traps at temperatures of minus three. Um, but that's when we was doing silly things like going checking the moth trap on Christmas day and Boxing day and the 27th of December and the 28th of December. But yeah, if you're into it, why not? Again, they feed on a broad range of um, broadleaf trees and, and I have a wee video here. It's not much, but just, in fact, it's a pretty rubbish video, but it shows you, you know, it's, it's nearly 3D. Nearly 3D, if you use a bit of imagination. Uh, and, the, you know, this is sort of moth. It's sitting there on my the palm of my hand. Why is it not flying away? Well, you could argue that it's cold, but this is a moth that can fly in, you know, really cold conditions. Um, but also, it, it, it thinks I'm a predator. So the safest thing to do is don't move, which is great if you want to have a good look at it. And it's not really bothering the moth. All you need to do is... Uh, you know, make sure you hide it away somewhere out of prying eyes, like that of a song thrush or other bird that would take it for lunch. But uh, yeah, one of my favorite moths is, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, some of these moths, they are like a calendar. That's why climate change is a bit annoying because some moths you could have depended that, you know, they should be out around this time. But then, you know, as I say, December moth, it kind of bucks the trend in the sense that, you know, it comes up, you know, records from September, October. Um, but uh, a stunning creature, uh, you do wonder how it's able to fly in such cold temperatures. Um, they use physical action, shaking their wings and things like that, which, you know, increases their ambient body temperature. But also, uh, I think some of them have almost the equivalent of antifreeze inside them. You know, they can, unlike some other invertebrates, you know, um, and then there's one the winter moth. So this is one that's always described as the moth that you'll see most regularly at your windows in winter. And also the moth that you would see in car headlights. Um, I mean, that doesn't mean that every single moth that you see when you're driving along, along a winter or, you know, a country lane or something like that is going to be a winter moth because the, as you'll see, there are other moths that are out there, but um, it, it is one of the most common moths that you find in winter. Um, the weird thing is, is that the females can't fly. 
they have reduced wings. So what they do is they uh, they basically uh, during the evening time or yeah, basically because to climb up the trunk of a tree during the evening time and then emit pheromones, and then it's the males that fly to them. Um, so it's just a different strategy that they, that they use. I'm not really sure of why the females are uh, wingless or have reduced wings. Um, it probably just means that there's, you know, instead of two flying about, it, it, you know, the female's hiding on a tree trunk. So it, it's only going to be found by the male because he's following the pheromones. So, and this, some people would say that it's reflective of static habitat. So woodland is a fairly permanent habitat so you know you don't need males and females flying around so much but i'm not i'm pretty sure they just don't really know why these things but um the other one that's similar to north uh, winter moth is northern winter moth but it is really really rare moth it's only recorded in northern ireland within the island of ireland um and you know it, you really well it is it rare or is it under recorded because how many people are going out and looking for winter moths and if it's a moth that you see flying in your car headlights, it's not like you, unless, yeah, well, I've done it before myself, but it's not like you're going to stop the car, jump out with a butterfly net, in, you know, the middle of December and try and catch the moth at the side of the road. I suppose if you did, you might might turn up more winter moths, but uh, it's more about looking for them in woodland with by torchlight. Um, and that is the female winter moth. It's a really, really weird looking creature. Um, as you can see, it does have wings, but they're just then you know reduced entirely reduced down to you know they're pointless as wings. Uh, and you can see she's a big fat body, and that's because she's laden with eggs. And uh, there's studies out there that have shown that you know a lot of these species, when okay, you think it's the the female emits the pheromones, therefore that's all that the female needs to do because the male's head will be so muddled and filled full of you know perfume if you like that he'll, he can't resist. But actually, studies have shown that an awful lot of these moths, whilst they're attracted to a female, it depends how big she is. Because the bigger she is, the bigger her abdomen is, it means the more stuffed with eggs she is. So that's a better mate. So it's a two-way process. You know, it's not just about, you know, uh, waft some pheromones about and jobs are good. Uh, but a really weird looking creature when you think about it. Um, there's the male and the female winter moths. Uh, somebody decided to, you know, get involved, you know, when they shouldn't have, and they should have just left those two moths alone. But then, I suppose we wouldn't have this picture. But uh, you can see, I mean, there's a it's a big fat female when you look at the abdomen compared to the male, um, and essentially they're attached by the male's claspers, and uh, there has been recorded where the male will fly off with the female attached. Um, but yeah, quite weird, quite weird. Not what you would expect from a moth. Um, there's another moth, uh, absolutely stunning looking moth, really, um, the herald moth. And why does it get its name? Well, some people would argue it's the herald of autumn. Some people argue it's the herald of spring. The thing is, is that it, it comes out in the autumn time. So suddenly, you know, it, concurrent with the start of autumn or the end of autumn. Uh, and similarly, uh, it hibernates then and comes out in spring. Uh, but it is, it's one of those moths that is a real treat to see. It's its quite a stout moth. It's quite a large moth and it, it's really impressive. Um, and the thing is they hibernate together. So it's one of those moths that you can, you know, if you have a garden shed, I know it sounds stupid, but if you have a garden shed or you have a barns or outbuildings, uh, you know, if you have a cave, not that too many have a cave, I was going to say not too many people have cellars in this country. Some people might, but uh, yeah, if you have a cave, um, you know, go with a torch or or even in the daytime and look, and then it'll have to be somewhere that isn't damp. You know, um, that's the one thing I've noticed when I've been looking for uh, herald moths. And the other thing I love about herald moths is they have stripy legs. Uh, I'll see if this video works or oh, should do. So this is uh, a video of a place I went to at the weekend, which has uh, hibernating. Um, Harold Moss, it's a Sutteran uh, near me, and that's the sort of place that you'd want to look as well. You know, sort of, uh, you know, old, old churches, th any of those things. And there you can see gathered together in the roof in a dry space. Um, and they're there for months, months and months and months. Um, and there's one hibernating on his own. What's that? Billy No Mates there, you know, um, quite weird. 
Um, the other thing that I find quite weird is that um, in these caves and in buildings and things, these moths are sharing them with uh, with spiders. I mean, there's a picture. So that, you know, they're all gathered together. Why are they all point the same way? I don't think that's relevant. But actually, in the background of that photograph, you can see there's the spinnings of a, a of a spider. So why aren't the spiders eating the moths? I'm sure it's not by some kind of pre mutual agreement. I and mean, there must be something about the herald moths that's unpalatable, maybe. You know, because you would think it would be easy. That's a hefty meal for any spider. Um, so there must be something about it. Um, and there you go, Billy No Mates, the Herald Moth, all on his own. Some, and there's the stripy legs, which the picture doesn't do any justice to. When you have a Herald Moth in your hand or you're looking at it, it, it really is quite striking. I know that's a bit daft, really, but it's it's just I do like all things moths and stripy legs and a Herald Moth is one of the things I like the most. Maybe it sounds stupid. And then we're into the the you know there's a whole range of these moths here, um, mottled umber. So there's a lot of moths that look similar and mottled umber kind of complicates things because it's got these different color forms as well. So these are all males. Again, the females are wingless. Um, and you can see that on the top left there, you've got that sort of, you know, fully suffused, uh, modeled kind of uh, pollination. But, and then the top right, you've got you know, there's just a couple of you know, faint stripes and lines through it. And then into those sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, double colored, you know, sort of more contrasting pattern. Um, and same thing, females sit on a tree trunk, males come to them. Uh, and again, the caterpillars of that species feed on a, a wide variety of trees and shrubs, you know, um, mostly deciduous trees and shrubs. Um, so that's October to December. And then, oh, there's the female of model number. So, you can't see any wings on that at all. I mean, the wings will be there. They'll, you can just about make them out near the, you know, near the head there. It's just a little tuft. Uh, doesn't look like a moth at all. Doesn't look like a moth at all. And even if people saw it, even in the daytime, maybe they wouldn't think it was a moth even then, you know, but still it's a striking thing. Uh, the thing about that, so back to the model number. So the common variety of color forms. So, that's October to December, and there is a bit of overlap with that species, scarce umber. I suppose I, I could have got a better photograph, but I suppose the reason it's stuck in that photograph, well, number one, it was my photograph, so we didn't have to worry about copyright. Uh, but also, it's you can see how these can be confusion species, you know. Um, quite often you're not, when you see these moths, if they do come to your kitchen window or you know, you, or you, you do see them perchance by the, in the day, you're not necessarily going to get that perfect moth that you see in the book. You know, you might get a, one that's a bit battered, a bit worn. Um, so you can, you know, you can get confusion between these model numbers and the scarce numbers. Scarce number is actually, you know, as the name says, um, it is genuinely scarce. You can see the map there. That's a, a map from uh, Moths Ireland. Um, and you can see at the bottom there, it gives you the flight period, you know, sort of. And so there is overlap between um, both. So, you know, there is a you know, possibility, you know, confusion, but um, by and large, it's going to be model number that you see, but then you have dotted border. So that's awfully similar to that. It's similar to that. It's, you know, it's a wee bit of caution. I'm not saying that these are, they're not, it's not like they're undoable. They are all doable. Um, but, you know, just a bit of caution, sometimes required. And again, same thing, flightless females and the, the, the caterpillars feed on a wide variety of trees. And actually, I've got the caterpillar book here in front of me. And if I go back to model number, when, you know, I should have mentioned, you know, uh, caterpillars feed on a wide variety of trees and shrubs. Now, sometimes when they say that in the book, you know, they mean, you know, half a dozen species, but model number feeds on, uh, including apple, aspen, beech, bilberry, birches, blackthorn, bird cherry, sweet chestnut, dog rose, elms, hawthorns, hazel, honeysuckle. honeysuckle. You get the idea. This is a moth that caterpillars feed on, you know, and that's why it's so common because it's got so many, you know, it, it's not fussy about its food plants. Um, so scarce umber, you're not necessarily likely to run into because um, it's just, well, it, it, it's a, the question I always ask myself, is it genuinely scarce or is it because it comes out during the winter, not as many people are looking out for it, not as many people are running moth traps. You know, the weather is generally 
a bit poor, you know, more days of rain. Um, so, yeah. And then I'm talking about overlap. So you, you have the, the, the model number, the scarce number, but then you're getting into January and this is a moth that kind of kicks off from now. Uh, so it would be the sort of thing that you'd be less inclined to see things like scarce number. And now you'd be looking for things like uh, dotted border. And again, wide variety of uh, food plants with caterpillar and the flightless females. Um, and there's a moth in the same family. Um, and it's a moth that, you know, I would love people to keep more of an eye, or even if you have a moth trap, run it. Or, or I'm loath to say, you know, leave the porch light on because we shouldn't be doing things like that. Um, you know, wasting energy and, you know, creating light pollution. But, you know, if you could generate something, you know, a significant record, you know, which in itself contributes to conservation, then something like spring usher would be it. Um, Two records for Northern Ireland. Um, it's something that's common in England. Um, it's it's a species that right now, you know, in the next few weeks, moth trappers in England are going to say, "Yeah, it's great. I can't wait to see the spring ushers." Yet in Northern Ireland, one record in eighteen ninety three, and uh, one record in Belfast in two thousand. Uh, but if you look at the dates, I mean, the seventh of the second. So you know, give it a couple of weeks, and we're starting to get into. And they must be out there. A moth does not occur you know, two records, 107 years apart. It's not the only two spring ushers ever to have existed in Northern Ireland. They must be out there. And you can see on that map from Moths Ireland, um, there is a little, you know, there are colonies down south. Uh, maybe it is more of a, a southern species, but then there's been a northern trend and a movement for species. So maybe, you know, it is likely that we might encounter spring usher more and more. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, a meaty prize for anybody who gets the next spring usher record because it, it will mean, you know, it means something for conservation. It means that the species is out there and then in turn will help determine if there's any actions could be taken to conserve. Um, so those are the, the main sort of adult moths, the sort of the, the, the macro moths. Uh, most of them are geometrids, apart from things like the angle shades. You've got the two broad families of macro moths, which would be uh, geometrids and noctuids making up most of the species. Um, and I'd say most of the ones that fly during winter belong to the geometrid family. Um, but then you do have things like moth pupae, and this is, again, this is into the dark arts. This is the sort of stuff that you would find throughout the year, sort of some, summertime onwards. And if you're digging in the garden or turning, off, turning over a sod, things like that, or even doing a bit of weeding and you pull out, um, you know, say a plant and you pull out the roots with it, you might find these moth pupae in it. Um, they're best left where they are, though, you know, you can take them in and there are, you can look up on the internet and there are ways that you can rear these pupae uh, and then you'll find out what they are. That Those two, I just looked up large yellow underwing uh, pupae, but I mean, there's so many of them look so similar, you know, quite often it's hard to make a determination. Um, well, there are websites that are out there that'll help you. Um, the odd thing about these, if you've ever encountered them, you'll know is that um, if I click the next video, hopefully this will, oh, it's probably not going to work, you know. Oh, yeah, it might do. They actually move. So the if you the heat of your hand that's this is different. These are sphinx moths or what we would call hawk moths in North America. So those pupae are actually reacting to each other. Perhaps they know they're in close proximity. So it's almost like perhaps there's a competitor. But similarly, if you find the other moth pupae uh, and hold them in the palm of your hand, the heat of your hand, you'll quite often watch them twitch. And it I don't know, but to me it's like something out of uh, Alien. Yeah, you know, it really is. Uh, it just maybe proves in my mind how far apart we are uh, from, uh, uh, what do you call it? From invertebrates. I'm just looking there. One of the next videos is how to pin a moth. It's not very nice. Uh, let me see. So, yeah. And then you're into things like the micro moths. And this is where most people start to, you know, tip peel off and fall asleep and things like this. But these are moths that you still moths that you will encounter. And this is a moth that you'll find in your house. Um, there are other house moths. There's uh, brown house moth and uh, there's the clothes moths and things like that. Um, but this this moth actually can be found at any time of year. And if it's warm enough and it, it breeds continuously throughout the year, 
And it's actually one of the most widespread moths in the world um, because the caterpillars feed on basically anything. If you look there, the caterpillars feed on grains, basically vegetable matter and animal matter. And that includes rotten wood. So this is a moth that has spread to Australia when, whenever they brought cattle to Australia in the ships and the, these moths were in the dung. It spread all over the world, especially wherever you have human beings, you will have white shouldered house moth, excluding Antarctica. And let's hope they never, ever do be able to survive in Antarctica. Because that means we're all doomed because uh, it'd be far too hot. Um, but uh, like a lot of these house moths, people think they eat their clothes. And I mean, yeah, you could argue that this would eat um, vegetable matter. So in theory, yeah, maybe could eat cotton, but it, it doesn't need to. Um, there is only one moth, a common clothes moth. Uh, and that, that there's, a, you know, well, two moths. There's, there's a couple of, there's a case band clothes moth and the common clothes moth. They're, they're the only two species that eat clothes uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, I don't know what it is about me, but there's very few records of both. But uh, the case band clothes moth seems to follow me around the world. And yeah, it do, I will attest that it has at my carpet and other things. Um, there's another moth again. These you're getting it, uh, you know, very brown and drab. Um, perhaps you'd argue that all the moths I've shown you tonight are brown and drab, uh, but then it's a brown and drab world out there in winter time, and it wouldn't do you uh, much good to be nice and brightly colored, uh, unless you're extremely poisonous. Um, but uh, Agnopteryx heracliana, um, I can't remember the English name, uh, it's too hard for me to remember all the English names of micro moths, uh, but this basically can be found anytime sort of August, September, right the way through to April. In fact, there's records of it all, all year round. Uh, feeds on umbellifers, so that's things like cogweeds and cow parsley, things like that, you know, even including things like parsnip, although young carrot, but that's the family, I mean, not what the caterpillar feeds on. And it's a, it's a moth that regularly comes to light. So it's, it's one that, you know, it's one of those moths that you'll find dead on your windowsill, you know. Uh, it's one of those moths that you'll find, you know, you know, if you looked at your car headlights or something, you know, actually at the car headlights, it might be stuck to one of them, you know. Um, the, it is a confusion species. I mean, look what that person's done to that poor moth. I'm, I'm not against setting moths for conservation. I'm only pulling your leg. But um, that a uh, reason I put that picture in is that, again, this is a moth. It, I like to call it Agonopteryx heracliana, but actually there's two species. And uh, one of them, uh, if you look at the hind wing, um, it's actually got uh, a four narrow bands, whereas that, by the fact it doesn't have the bands, means it's Agonopteryx heracliana, but really all you can do is lump them all together and call them Agonopteryx heracliana ag. That was pretty painful, That even I found that pretty dry, I have to admit. Uh, I'll flip me in, I thought that was bad. This is a moth, though, that you will find everywhere. That's the moth, Stigmella aurella. You probably won't see that moth because it's tiny. It's a six millimeter wingspan, which means the moth is probably about three millimeters long or thereabouts. Uh, but it is probably the most common moth in UK and Ireland, if not one of the most common moths in Northern Europe. Um, now, the thing is, there's an awful lot of moths that look similar to it. They are all different species and they're all stigmellus and they're all tiny. The only way you can tell the adults apart is by dissection. But thankfully, stigmella aurella, that's what it does on a bramble leaf. So next time you're out for a, for a walk, you know, and looking around at any time of the year, where there's bramble, by and large, you can find this, you know, those signs and that that, that squiggle, which goes from a little tiny squiggle and then you know gets bigger and bigger and bigger and almost turns into a blotch at the end, is where the caterpillar started out as an egg and a tiny, tiny caterpillar. And as it munched its way through the leaf, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's why the line gets bigger, because that's the space that the caterpillar, that's basically, that line is basically where there used to be, you know, plant material. Uh, the map doesn't really do it justice because it, it literally is everywhere. It's just that people don't notice it. Um, I, mean, that, I mean, these pictures, I just, they, they were around the corner, like 30 yards from the house. That's how easy it is to find. On that leaf there, I mean, oh, I kind of think there's on that one leaf there was about seven or eight uh, stigma or else. I kind of like to think that was enough, you know, like a, a group of caterpillars having a mad party, a mad, you know, gorging orgy of, you know, eating, because uh, that's all caterpillars like to do. It's all they exist to do is to eat. Um, and you're getting into the real weird stuff. Yes, I know. But, um, you know, earlier on in the year, you know, 
quite often you look for these moths and they're on the leaves of the trees and on the shrubs, you know, attached to the plant. But then what happens to the leaves when they drop on the ground? Well, some of the leaves, you'll notice that there's green patches stay in them and they're called green islands. And that's where, and you can see in that photograph, that's a dead leaf. It's a dead oak leaf. And I picked that up and inside it, several weeks after it had fallen off the tree, the caterpillar was living inside the leaf because there's a relationship between bacteria and the caterpillar, which prevents the leaf taking back the chlorophyll into the, into the main plant. So whereas the rest of the leaf dies off, the bacteria is allowed to create a little green island, which that caterpillar can continue to feed in after it's fallen off the tree. Totally crazy. Um, and then the other one that's a bit mad, and this is one, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a long shot, but I'm just asking people if they ever see something like this. A little tiny ball of twigs, uh, you know, spun together, essentially that pointing up little bits of grass, if you like. Um, that's a caterpillar inside that, and it's a thing called Psyche Casta. It's called a bag worm. And yeah, a, a, if you like, a, a caterpillar is a maggot, is a worm. Um, so yeah, it, it lives in its own little bag. It makes a bag for itself out of uh, bits of uh, green, well, not greenery, but um, you know, twigs and plant material. It's not easy to find, and there's only ever been one record from Northern Ireland, and that was it. Um, and there's the actual adult moth. I mean, not much to look at, but I mean, it's it's an odd thing, but you may actually see that. And if you do see that, you make me very, very happy. You know, um, these things exist. You know, it's just a question, I guess, of almost having telescopic eyes because it's the sort of thing that you would just eat, you'd just overlook, you know, it's so hard. Um, but that's, you know, once these things are implanted, you know, you never know. Somebody might strike it lucky. They are out there. Um, and then when we're getting into sort of, you know, those are the moths of in, in winter, um, you're getting into the moths that are coming out. And, you know, it's it's still, you know, if you like February, March, yeah, you could be talking it's spring, but it's still cold. And one of the first moths to come out is the aptly named early moth. Um, it's the sort of thing, again, under-recorded because not many people are looking because, if you look and went out even with a torch, you would find this around Blackthorn. It just it, that's what the caterpillars feed on, and that's what that's what the, the, the adult moth hangs around. Um, first one I ever saw was a, a guy said to me, Have you seen early moth? And I went, No, he says, put a moth trap, a uh, small moth trap next to a patch of blackthorn, and you'll get early moth. Funnily enough, the next morning there was early moth. Um, but it's one of those ones that you know is a harbinger of you know things waking up, I like to think. Uh, again, not too many records. Again, the female is is wingless, you know, not a weird looking creature. Um, but it's definitely worth going out and looking with a torch, I think, you know, and, you know, just anything at all. Sometimes seeing anything at all in winter is a boon, you know, just seeing one species. You may have seen it a thousand times, but it's still worth, you know, it will give you a little lift as a kind of little tonic. Um Certainly seeing something like an early moth. I've never seen a female early moth, you know, so that's something I have to do myself, you know, because I would love to see one. It's just so odd looking. Uh, and there's the moths that you might, you know, once you get into spring, you know, these are the things that start to come out. And, you know, I just stuck that in. Because suddenly, you know, from this sort of dearth of species, suddenly things start to kick in, you know, and it can be quite early. Things change so much these days. I mean, you know, those species there on the screen, common Quaker, Hebrew character, March moth, things like that. Um, you know, I would expect to see them sort of late February um, or in most years, you know, mid-March onwards. But things, you know, things can get weird and these things can start coming out, you know, in early February. Uh, so is that part of the natural cycle or is, you know, the whole phenology of things getting uh, turned on its head? It's hard to say. Um, I mean, I, and then at the same time, anything can turn up. That's the other thing to look at, um, you know, just because something looked weird and, you know, uh, when you go to the book or you go to the website and somebody says it's never been recorded before, never been recorded in Ireland. Well, why should you be wrong? You know, because potentially anything can happen. Uh, I mean, that's the species I recorded as first to Northern Ireland. It was the second to Ireland. Uh, and it's, it's sort of that weather map on the, on the right there kind of shows you if you kind of follow the sort of the, the lines you can see around the Canary Islands is a, a plume of warm air coming up towards Ireland and uh, the you know the UK. Um, 
and that brings that brings more. It just doesn't bring just moths, of course. It'll bring other invertebrates, but quite you know, quite a lot of different species can be blown in, and essentially anything can turn up. Um, that kind of leads me into you know, if you are into that sort of thing, you know, and you do want to know more about um, these things, you can buy the books. Uh, but there's an awful, such an awful lot of stuff online, and you know, if you're interested in that, there's migrant Lepidoptera GB in Ireland. You know, you go on that Facebook, these are all Facebook pages, by the way, and you go on that Facebook page and that'll give you a feel of what's turning up in the south of Ireland, what's turning up in, you know, England and maybe even further afield. And then you can almost, you know, not predict, but, you know, time it and say to yourself, yeah, I'll, I'll put out the moth trap tonight and I'll see what I'll get. And yeah, OK, maybe nine times out of ten. Uh, nothing happens but every now and then you strike gold <clears throat> and certainly if you're just interested in you know just learning about moths there's two brilliant facebook pages there uh the butterfly conservation northern ireland page uh for all our local stuff um uh, quite good discussion on there and the moths ireland page you know again another you know another brilliant page i mean and then you look at the members there i mean there's uh well one 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 point one thousand seven hundred uh for the butterfly conservation and two and Near two and a half thousand. So that you know, you're talking four thousand people actively engaged in that, you know, and four thousand people can't be wrong. There must be something good about these butterflies and moths. Uh, and there's some websites again. A lot of the map, map maps that I used there tonight were from Moths Ireland. So I, I asked uh, Angus for permission. Uh, the guy who runs it, uh, and um, the other good website there is UK Moths, which basically attempts to you know show and give a small, short description of every moth in the UK and Ireland. And then if you are record, want to record moths and interested in sort of contributing to their understanding, uh, it's either send the records to me directly as the moth recorder, or you could go on to see their online recording, which is part of uh, the Ulster Museum or the National Museums of Northern Ireland. Uh, and they do have the recording forms on there, including a moth form. Uh, and that way the records get to me and then they get included in the Northern Ireland database. And then they also then get included in the All Ireland database and also get included in the the national moth recording scheme which is uh, sort of like the overarching all of uk and ireland where all the moth rec records go which there's in excess of 20 million records i think maybe even much more now and uh, so there's lots of ways to get involved and if you're just interested in, and you, i'm not saying you have to put in records i mean you, you might just be interested in it for the sake of being interested in it and just entertaining yourself and you know there's no there's nothing wrong with that so if you're interested in seeing what moths are about there's there is an app um and it is on the laptop as well you just you don't have to just use it on your phone but it's called what's flying tonight which was the center for ecology and hydrology inputted all the moth records that they had at the time uh the public accessible ones and then made the app so i tipped in my location there bt33 newcastle and uh you know, that was on the 7th of January. So there's the moth. So tonight, going on the records that have been put in in the past, this is, you know, this is what they say. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you put out a moth trap or something comes flying to your window tonight. And, it, you know, it, it's not hard and fast, but just going on the records that are available. Um, and then, you know, this can be used. I said that for January the 7th, but you can use it. Uh, there's July the 7th. So you change it manually by the date and... There we go. So it's, it's a real good guide. If you are interested, you know, you can pick it up and go, you know, and it just gives you that extra bit of confidence that, you know, yeah, this is, this isn't something out of the ordinary, you know, because quite often there's common moths and they do look quite weird. And you, you might think that you've got something absolutely crazy, um, but it may be common enough. That doesn't take away from the fact that it's an absolutely spectacular creature, you know? Um, so that's a really good, uh, really good app and it's a good guide I, I do enjoy that one but um at the same time um if you are interested the way to go is the books you know because there's nothing like sitting down i mean reading a website's one thing but sitting down and digesting some of the stuff that's in the books now the books do go out of date i suppose that's the adva advantage of um the websites you know if they're kept up to date but uh, a lot of these books are in their you know second and third editions now um they're not cheap as all i would say because all those field guides um they seem to hold their value um so you know you're talking maybe well amazon will do a deal i suppose you could get them around 23 25 pounds the interesting thing though is to say they hold their value so even if you're looking a second hand copy somebody would be looking 22 23 pounds and you go that's a bit mad 
it, but um, the thing is, quite often the information doesn't change that much, uh, and quite often, sometimes you know the the third edition or fourth edition might have minor adjustments, if you like, uh, or or add maybe a dozen species. Um, but no, the books are a good way to go, and also you know you can't always get phone signal everywhere. Uh, but if you've got a wee tiny rucksack, you can always set room for a moth book. Well, I find anyway, in amongst all the jars and the butterfly net and yeah, all those other things. And I think that's it. It must be it because I'm getting awful croaky now. And I think I've done me, I've talked myself out. So just to say, thanks very much for coming along and listening to me. Um, and there is just, you can see on that slide there, that it's part of a series of talks that we're doing at Ulster Wildlife. Um, so the next one's by Gala, a living seas officer on sustainable seafood. That actually sounds quite interesting. Um, and yeah, as I said at the start, if you if you are a member, thanks very much for all your support, especially, you know, given it's a crazy world out there and, you know, uh, we need all the help. Everybody needs all the help we can get, but it is, it is much valued. And if you're not a member, you know, well, yeah, as I say, January is the time to join because it's the half price sale. So Everybody loves a bargain. I know I do. And I think that's it. Um, somebody wants to put their hands up. Or I don't know, something like that. If anybody does have any questions and all. Yeah, um, is it, Bar it says Barbara, but. Yes, yeah, I'm really George. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Barbara's about it. I would be very much, uh, I'm not an expert, uh, into bird watching and things like that, but I'm interested in Ross. And last year, I bought myself a heath trap. Yeah. And uh, I've tried it once, and uh, that was about last October. If I do find some moss, they can be quite hard to identify. Hmm. Uh, if I take a photograph, can I send that to somebody? Yeah, well, that's where those, uh, that's where the Facebook groups come in quite handy, because that's essentially, you know, one of the services that they fulfill. So if you go onto the Moss Ireland or the Butterfly Conservation page, you know, if you put up the photograph, you know, people are really, people are really good. Some people kind of worry. I mean, even I would worry sometimes to think, oh, I've got this wrong or to feel a bit stupid about putting up a picture of a common moth. But, you know, quite often, look, people like me like to be kept on our toes as well. You know what I mean? So sometimes, and sometimes, you know, you think you might have something, you know, common, common garden thing, but you put it up and it could be something quite special. So the Moths Ireland and the Butterfly Conservation uh, Northern Ireland Facebook pages, uh, putting up, you know, photographs onto that, that's usually the, the quickest way, you know, because somebody will get back to you very quickly. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try here, Pam, um, if I can. Let's see, I'm st struggling with technology here. Yeah, hi. Yeah, I found Moss Island really helpful. You take the photo with your phone, um, it's the best way to get the photograph I found than trying to use a fancy camera. But um, now my question is what, I mean, I've set the chap out several nights during the winter and got absolutely nothing. Um, tried different areas of the garden and I'm quite close to a wood and field. Um, I just wonder what, what are the moths feeding on at this time of winter? The mm. adult moths if they're in flight. Yeah, well, quite often it's things like... Uh... It's things that if you think how long blackberries last, blackberries do persist quite long into the winter. Uh, and things like ivy, ivy is much underrated. Yeah. Um, so uh, any flowers that they can access, but quite often you find that um, it's the last thing on their minds for some of them. <laughs> some of them are just totally geared to mating and that's it. So for some species, an awful lot of the preparation has been done in the caterpillar stage. So they're, they're flying around essentially just looking for a mate, uh, oh, but right. they, will, they will take the opportunity to feed. Um, but, it, you know, yeah, but, the, and, and they will, I mean, they, they, some of the best times to look for moths, if you if you hit it right, is, you know, when things like the ivy, it is worth going out into the garden with a torch. Yeah, I mean, I have got a very big ivy hedge, um, and most of the flowers have, are over now, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll try Anne and Alster here. I going to ask Mark the same thing about um, how many empty traps would you expect for this time of year? I mean, oh, uh, em empty moth traps? I, I would just depend. It's all dependent upon the weather. 
I mean, to be honest, I always look to things like cloud cover. If you've got cloud cover, I mean, because so much heat is lost during the day once you lose the cloud cover. Any heat that, you know, even on a moderately sunny day, you know, with a bit of cloud cover that, the well, and again, you know, I say that, but at the same time, it's it's not it's not a good thing at the same time that we're able to get so many moths in moth traps during the winter because it is reflective of much, much more milder conditions than ordin ordinarily. You know, I mean, I mean, I live near the coast, but it's I don't get as many frosts as we used to. And I well, I think it's great whenever I'm putting out moth traps. It's like, oh, I've got great opportunity to get moths and things like that. I don't necessarily think it's good because things have changed so much, but yeah, generally avoiding cloud cover. Also, um, undercover, you know, putting moth traps undercover. Because if you think, you know, if there's a frosty night, well, you don't get a frosty night under, you know, under trees. You know, just that little bit of cover, um, that, that makes an enormous difference. Whereas if you have your moth trap out in the open and it's a frosty night, yeah. I mean, to be honest, the moths, apart from those that are really strongly attracted to light, will pro if, you, if there was a woodland nearby, they probably wouldn't venture from the woodland to the moth trap because of the change in temperature. There's, but I mean, yeah, there's so many species and there's so many variables, it's hard to say, but by and large, uh, avoid cloud-free nights if you can. Uh, windy nights aren't necessarily that good unless it's coming from the south. And to be honest, some of the best moths that I've, I've ever had have come after storms, particularly after hurricanes and things like that. Uh, and some of the best moths I've ever had have come on really, really blowy nights. But then I've been keeping an eye on things like those migrant lepidoptera. So they, the, the guy who runs the migrant lepidoptera Facebook page, he, he does the weather charts and they also will give a, a quick explanation of the weather charts. So you don't need to, you know, know all about isobars or things. So they are usually quite self-explanatory, but yeah, uh, that way you can sort of be primed and, you know, if you can say, well, yeah, it looks like that weather pattern's coming our way or, but yeah, it's, it's just sometimes pot luck as well, though. Pot luck. But yeah, avoid frost and really windy conditions. And rain can be good, despite what people think. Rain can be good. Because sometimes when it's raining, it keeps the temperature up. Put it this way, if it's raining, it's not frosty. You know? Um, trying to see if there's anybody else. Any other questions? Can't see any. Don't think. No, let's have a look to the list here. Can't see anybody. Outstanding at the minute. Okay. Okay, okay. Well, on that note, then I might actually stick to time. I'm, I'm actually ahead of time for once. I managed not to burble myself into infinity here and keep everybody 25 minutes longer than they wanted. So, excellent. Thanks very much for coming along, everybody. And uh, yeah, I'll, and do, do, if you can, get a chance, jump into the next talk. Okay. Thank you. Bye.